you have your Bibles today, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. And if you didn't bring your Bible with you today, you'll find Bibles in the chair pockets around you. stood up and tested him, tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? <coughs> then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell down thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we welcome you among us morning. We thank you, Father, for the empowering presence of your Holy Spirit as we celebrate the gift of new life that we have through your Son. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us from it, that you move in our minds to give us understanding, in our hearts to bring conviction. Father, I pray that you would be exalted in my life today. And I pray, Lord, that you set a guard on my lips that I would speak those things that are right and true. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. Whenever I watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, a number of biblical truths have always been reinforced for me. First of all, the extent of God's love that Jesus would endure all that he endured so that we might have a relationship with God. And secondly, the seriousness of my sin. That Jesus had to endure all that he endured so that we could have a relationship with God. It's that second truth that I think we lose sight of much of the time, which then affects our perception of the first truth. You see, there's no way we can truly understand the extent of God's love for us until we first understand the seriousness of the sin that separated us from Him. And I don't think that most of us really understand the seriousness of our sin. We grow so accustomed to rationalizing our sins, and our culture has become so adept at giving us excuses for our sins that we hardly feel like we've done anything all that bad. In fact, most of the time, we don't even refer to our sins as sin or even as the wrong things we do as wrong. A man cheats on his wife, a woman gets an abortion, a boy gets arrested for drug possession, a girl has a drunk driving accident in which a family is killed, four guys get into a bar fight and bust up the bar, a man steals tools from his employer, a woman gossips about someone, a teenager shoplifts, and then what does the wrongdoer say? I made a mistake. But it wasn't a mistake. A 
mistake is when you do something unintentional. You're taking a test and the question is two times three equals blank. And in your haste, you write down four instead of six. That's a mistake. Or you're driving down the road and you can't really see all that well in the dark. You're looking for Armstead Court, but instead you turn on Armstrong Court. That's a mistake. But when you choose to cheat on your wife, when you choose to gossip about your friends, that's not a mistake. Yeah. It's a sin. First of all, against God, and secondly, against a fellow human being. But you see, we don't want to admit that. We don't want to see ourselves as bad people. And so when we do something bad, we have to somehow rationalize it or minimize it. And that's what we're doing whenever we refer to an intentional wrong as a mistake. We're trying to minimize the seriousness, the wickedness of what we've done. That way we can feel better about ourselves. That way we can keep telling ourselves that we're basically good people. Not at all like those people who are really bad. Murderers and child molesters and rapists. Of course, as I've mentioned to you before, even that comparison reveals something about us, doesn't it? That we have to compare ourselves with murderers, child molesters, or rapists in order to justify ourselves. In order to convince ourselves that we're good people. Yeah. But did you know that even a murderer, a child molester, and a rapist will try to minimize the seriousness of his sin? I was watching a documentary a few years ago about this man in New York who had kept women chained in a basement room of his house so he could have sex with them. The police had nicknamed him the Dungeon Master. And after he was arrested and when an interviewer was questioning him about what he had done, he began to explain that he really hadn't done anything all that wrong. He had kept the women in a clean room. They had a clean bed to sleep on. He brought them food and water every day. And in fact, he gave them anything they wanted. Plus, they enjoyed the sex just as much as he did. At least that's what he said. Never mind that they were chained to the bed as prisoners for months at a time. He didn't feel like he'd done anything wrong. But you see, we make the same rationalizations. In fact, I've heard words very similar to those from the dungeon master from guys who have one-night stands. Well, she's wanting it as much as I do. As long as she enjoys it too, what's wrong with Never mind that any woman who has one night stands probably has some serious psychological issues and was likely sexually abused when she was younger. But what's wrong with the guy taking advantage of that and becoming just one more of the guys who treats her like an object? Can you see how twisted that thinking is? And yet here's the darkness of our souls. It doesn't seem twisted this person is doing. He doesn't think he's doing anything all that bad. All of us, regardless of the sins we commit, have this dark part of us that wants to rationalize our sins and minimize their gravity. We do what we do because our father wasn't there for us. Because our mother caused us to have low self-esteem. Because other people influenced us to do it. Because we have a syndrome or a genetic predisposition. Because we just couldn't control ourselves. Because anybody would have done what we did if they were in our situation. And on and on the excuses come. Anything and everything that will enable us to avoid admitting wrong and accepting personal responsibility for that wrong. And there is no attitude in all the world that is actually more in evidence of sin than that. In fact, you might say that the rationalizing of sin is the clearest evidence of sin and the greatest roadblock we face to forgiveness. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, choosing to disobey God rather than trusting Him. And then God sought out Adam and Eve, just as He seeks out us whenever we're separated from Him. Having eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, God asked in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And Adam and Eve could have said, Yes, Lord, we have sinned against you and pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us of our sin. But that wasn't what they said. 
Instead, listen to their response. Genesis 3, verses 12 and 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see what's happened? Instead of accepting personal responsibility, they're shifting the blame. Just like we, the descendants of Adam and Eve, continue to shift the blame to this very day. And God detests that. He's always detested it because that arrogance, that refusal to accept responsibility, is what prevents us from acknowledging that we have a problem and seeking forgiveness. One day, Israel's religious leaders asked Jesus' followers, why Jesus spent so much time with tax collectors and sinners? Because their perspective was that decent people wouldn't spend any time with people like that. And Jesus heard them, and he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call righteous, but sinners to and Jesus didn't say that because the religious leaders were righteous. He said that because the religious leaders thought they were righteous. They thought they were good enough. And so long as they saw themselves that way, they would never see the need of forgiveness. They would never see the need of a savior. Maybe other people needed one, like the prostitutes and the thieves and the murderers, but not them. They'd never really done anything all that bad. I remember back the first few years after I came here to the church, and at that time, we used to have an altar call at the end of the service, and if you wanted to accept Christ, instead of just raising your hand, you actually have to walk down the aisle. And I gave that altar call on Sunday, and this young man had come with another of his friends from our church, walked down the aisle, and he was in tears. And I prayed with him to accept Christ. And then later on that week, I called him up to try to make an arrangement to get together with him. And his mom answered the phone. He still lived at home. And she asked me if I was going to speak to him. And I said, well, I wanted to get together with him to talk with him about the possibility of baptism and about the profession of faith he made this past Sunday. And she said, my son doesn't need to be saved. My son's a good boy. Believe me, her son was not a good boy. <laughs> But she didn't know that. The reason he was weeping when he came down the aisle is because he knew he wasn't good enough. And he needed forgiveness. But you see, you have to see that need of forgiveness. You have to know that you're sick before you'll ever see the physician. On another occasion, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. And the religious leaders called the man in for question. They wanted to disprove the miracle or at least discredit Jesus. Give God the glory, they demanded of the man. We know that this man, meaning Jesus, is a sinner. And the man answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But I do know this, that though I was blind, now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes, they asked. I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And the religious leaders became furious. They threw the man out. Basically, they're excommunicating him from the synagogue. Beginning in verse 35 of John chapter 9, we're told, we're told what happened next. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? The man answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped Jesus. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Over and over 
end of the gospel, you find Jesus trying to help the religious leaders see the seriousness of their sin problem. But they had become so used to comparing themselves with the people they, they saw as worse than themselves, and so expert at justifying and making excuses for their own bad choices that they couldn't even see the seriousness of their sin. And so as a result, they couldn't see their need for forgiveness and mercy or a Savior. Friends, the truth is all of us need forgiveness. Every single one of us stands in need of God's mercy. The only difference between us is that some of us come to the place where we realize that, and some of us don't. And that's also the situation Jesus is addressing in the passage we opened up with this morning. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to earn my way to heaven? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Let love for God and love for others be the basis of everything you do, everything you say, everything you think. Never fall short of that perfect standard, and God will accept you. Then verse 29 goes on that he, the man wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my name? You know, the reason why most people feel like they're good enough to get into heaven just the way they are, why most people feel like they don't deserve to go to hell, is because they define the standard as well as the criteria as to whether they're living up to the standard. So one person thinks he doesn't deserve to go to hell because he's never done anything all that bad. And guess who gets to determine what's all that bad? He does. Another person says, well, I've never done anything to hurt anyone. And guess who gets to decide what constitutes having hurt someone? He does. Maybe you go on to question him. Well, did you ever lie to anyone? Did you ever talk about someone behind his back? Did you ever make a commitment to someone you didn't keep? In your anger, did you ever call someone a derogatory name or use profanity? Well, sure, he answers, but that's not all that bad. Everybody does things like that. I mean, I've never murdered anyone, raped anybody, or stolen anything. And so now the standard of I've never done anything to hurt anyone has been redefined to I've never murdered anyone, or raped anybody, or stolen anything. And so you go on, so you never cheated on a test or in a game? You never downloaded a song or a pirated movie from the internet? Well, I don't mean things like that, he answers. I don't think that's stealing. You see what's happening. The reason the guy feels like he's good enough, the reason he believes that he doesn't deserve to go to hell, is because he has established a standard that he can live up to. And whenever he doesn't live up to his own standard, he just redefines the standard. And that's a pretty convenient philosophy of life. One that most people in our world live by. It reminds me of an illustration that I've shared with you guys before from one of my seminary professors. He came to our classroom dressed in his usual suit and tie and wearing his dress shoes. And he began the class by saying, I will wager any of you in this room, any amount of money you want, that I can run a two-minute mile wearing exactly what I have right now. We can go outside the building right now and sell it. Given two conditions. Let me determine what constitutes a minute, and let me determine what constitutes a mile. See, based on that standard, we can all be Olympic athletes, couldn't we? There's just one problem. We already have an official measurement for a minute, and we already have an official measurement for a mile, just like we already have an official standard of righteousness. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
You shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. In Romans 2.16, the Apostle Paul tells us that the day is coming when God will judge the secrets of men by the standard of Jesus Christ. And anything and everything that falls short of that standard is sin. In fact, that's the biblical definition of sin. The word means to miss the mark, to miss the bullseye of a life that is perfectly reflecting of the glory of God. And this man talking to Jesus knows the standard. He quotes it in verse 27 of Luke 10. And Jesus says, you have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. But he, wanting to justify himself, because he knew he wasn't living up to that standard, he had to somehow redefine the standard. So he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? What's the minimum I can do to live up to that qualification and still make it? Of course, the question itself betrays his heart. Because love never asks what's the least I can do. Love seeks to do the most it can do. A man who loves his wife doesn't ask what's the least I can spend on my wife for a birthday present. He's usually trying to figure out what's the most he can spend. A person who loves playing softball doesn't ask, what's the least number of games I can play and still be on the team? He's usually trying to figure out how he can arrange his schedule to play more games. And so when this guy tries to get technical about who is his neighbor, you already know that his heart's not in the place that it needs to be. And so Jesus gives him an illustration. Starting in verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. These are two people whom you would, be, would have expected to help the man. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured him out of oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the man said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now I think that most of us actually miss a key part of this parable. We think that the main point is that we should be like the Good Samaritan. We should help people who are in need instead of being indifferent to their needs. And certainly that truth is contained in this parable. But it is not the answer to the religious leader's question. Remember the question the parable is answering. This man who wanted to justify himself, who wanted to feel good enough to be accepted by God just the way he was, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells him about this naked, wounded, helpless man lying in a ditch. A priest comes by and goes out of his way to avoid the man. A Levite comes by and he also doesn't want to get involved. And then the Samaritan comes along. And remember, the Samaritans were despised by the Jewish people. The Samaritan comes by and he helps the man. He nurses and bandages the wounds. He takes the man to an inn and takes care of him. The next day when he has to leave, he gives the innkeeper money and promises to pay him whatever he also takes to provide for the man. So which of these three was neighbor to the man who fell in the thieves, Jesus asks? He who showed mercy on the law of the I want you to notice that this lawyer who has such a prejudice against the Samaritans that he can't even bring himself to give the Samaritan credit for being The Samaritan is the neighbor. But remember the lawyer's original question, who is my neighbor? And the answer is, this Samaritan who showed mercy is your neighbor. But then, if the Samaritan is his neighbor, who does that make the lawyer in the story? 
If the Samaritan is his neighbor, the Lord will come to the man of Samaritan help. The man who was wounded, naked, and half dead. The man in need of mercy. That's the lawyer in the story. So now you see the main point. Who's my neighbor? The lawyer asked Jesus in an attempt to justify himself as good enough for God. The Samaritan, one of those people you despise and hate, he's your neighbor. Jesus answers through the parable. And you, who think you're good enough just the way you are, you're the one who's naked and wounded and half dead. You're the one who can't help himself. You're the one in need of mercy. Because you can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Because you can't love your neighbor as yourself. You're the one in need of mercy, which is also the answer to the very first question the lawyer had asked Jesus. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And basically Jesus' answer is, you can't measure up to what it takes to inherit eternal life. Because the standard is simply too high. And you're not the one who gets to define the standard, nor the criteria by which you measure up to it. Only God defines the standard. Only He is the judge. And His standard is perfection. His standard is the very character of God Himself. And so given that, you want to know what your only hope is? You want to know what you have to do to inherit eternal life? Your only hope is mercy. The hope that somehow in God's love, he will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Amen. And that's what I'm reminded of whenever I watch the Passion of Christ. When I see everything Jesus had to go through so that I can be forgiven. That's how great was my separation from a holy God. That's how serious my sin is in God's sight. That's what it cost God to purchase my soul. And apart from that sacrifice, apart from the suffering and death of Jesus on my behalf, I would have no hope of heaven. No hope of a relationship with God. John Newton, the former slave trader and author of our hymn Amazing Grace, once said, when I get to heaven, I'll be amazed at three things. I'll be amazed that those I thought would be there who are not. Those I did not think would be there who are. And the fact that I'm there at all. Let's pray. We are about to remember the sacrifice. Share communion. bread which represents Christ's body and the fruit of the vine which represents his blood. We're about to remember what it cost God to purchase our souls. To save us from our sins. As I ask God this morning to give you a renewed appreciation for all that he's done for you. So if you're with us today and you're not sure to get truly trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you raise your hand right now, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. This could be the day of your salvation. You may not be sure where you stand with God this morning. Be sure. All you need to do is raise your hand.
wants you to forgive. I'm not sure where you stand with God, but you want that forgiveness. It only comes through Christ. That new life, that hope, it only comes through Jesus. If you would like to know more about us, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.